so I'm Lonnie Berger, I'm director of the Institute for Research on Poverty. Um, and on behalf of IRP, the Lentman family, and the Department of Economics, I want to uh, welcome you to our 18th uh, Lentman lecture, uh, which also is coming on the heels of our 50th anniversary of IRP. And we had a really nice slideshow of 50 years of IRP, and then we had technical difficulties, so you're not seeing it. But <laughs> so we thought it would be nice to play as people were able to see it. Um, so the, unfortunately, the Lentman family couldn't make it tonight. Um, but they are with us in spirit, and we are, as always, grateful to them for their support, not only for the lecture series, but also for IRP more generally and for the university. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speaker, Cece Rouse, in just a minute, but I just want to first say a few words about um, Bob Lampman, for whom the lecture was um, named. So he was an economics professor here for over 30 years, um, and he was really the founder and guiding spirit of IRP. Um, so by all accounts, he was an exceptional and unique scholar, as well as teacher, mentor, and really individual. Um, so he was well known as the intellectual architect of the U.S. War on Poverty. So he served on the, on the Council of Economic Advisors in the 1960s um, and authored the chapter of the 1964 Economic Report of the President, which was really ended up being the blueprint for the Johnson administration's anti-poverty efforts. Um, his subsequent work, as many of you know, spanned the gamut of social welfare programs. Um, and he was really known for when, when thinking about a public policy or evaluating public policy, he became known for asking the simple question, what does it do for the poor? Um, so during his time in DC, one of the things that, that Bob uh, advocated for and worked with, with federal officials was to essentially establish a think tank around poverty issues. He wanted to establish a national research center that was dedicated to um, studying the nature, causes, consequences, and cures of poverty and uh, inequality. And so, as a result, in March of 1966, the University of Wisconsin got a contract to establish the Institute for Research on Poverty. Um, so 50 years later, we are continuing to be committed to Bob's vision to create better anti-poverty policy um, that's informed by rigorous research. Um, so Bob died in 1997, and after his death, the Lentman family um, working with IRP established this lecture series. And so it's organized every year by IRP in coordination with the Economics Department. Um, and it features uh, preeminent uh, poverty scholars whose work addresses the um, issues that Bob created his, or dedicated his career to. Um, so Cece Rouse is among the very top scholars in the world focusing on the economics of education. Um, I'm sure most, if not all of you, are familiar with her work. Uh, she is currently the Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. She's also the Lawrence and Shirley Katzman and Lewis and Anna Ernst Professor of Economics of Education and Professor of Economics and Public Affairs. Um, she's Senior Editor of the Future of Children. She's on the uh, editorial board of the American Economic Journal in the Economic Policy section. Um, she served on the National Council, uh, National Economic Council under uh, President Clinton. She was on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, she received her PhD from, in economics from Harvard in 1992, so she's accomplished quite a lot in not very much time. Uh, so her prominent papers include topics um, such as the economic benefits of community college attendance, um, school voucher, accountability, and financial incentive policies and programs, including the consequences of Milwaukee's private school voucher program on student achievement, um, the effect of student loan debt on career choices of college graduates, and the impact of computer assisted instruction on students' performance and reading and math. So I'm thrilled that Cece made time to join us today. Um, and she's going to talk about her work on the promise of education to foster upward mobility. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce you and welcome Thank you. Here. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I'm double mic'd, so I hope it's not too loud. Is this a little loud? No? A little feedback? A little feedback. A little feedback. What do we do about that? Might drive us all crazy for <laughs> 45 minutes. OK. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so we did sort of agree on this a year ago. So I came up with one of those titles that I could fit almost anything <laughs> under. I'm actually going to focus on higher education. At the time, I thought I might do some K through 12, but I want to actually focus on um, some, some insights from new research on ways in which we might be able to improve uh, outcomes from higher education. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be. I'm good. OK. So, um, so let me just motivate this uh, just a little bit. So Raj Chetty has been doing interesting work on mobility. 
I like to remind everybody uh, that this is very descriptive what he presents, but I think it's rather provocative. So this is one of his slides um, where his, some of his data where he's looking at the percentage of children um, who are earning more than their parents. Um, I think it's in their early 30s when he's looking at that by year of birth. And you can see that among children born in the 1940s, over 90% of them are going to go on to earn more than their parents in the, by their early 30s. By 1980, uh, that's only down to about 50%. So if we're really going to define the American dream as children doing better than their parents, um, we're losing a lot of ground and uh, we're, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough road to hoe in order to pull that back up. And why is that? Because if you look at how incomes have grown or not grown over the last half century, or even, even going back more, but I'm going to sort of focus on uh, starting in 1973, you can see that we've got a bit of a problem. So what we did was took annual income and said, what was the annual income? And I know that there's a pointer here somewhere. Oh, there we go. Um, so we took 1973 as we normalized everybody to 100 in 1973. Uh, everyone being the 20th percentile and median 95th percentile. And so then what you do is compare years before 1973 to see whether there's been growth or not, or, uh, not growth uh, since then. And what is obvious is that if you look at the 20th percentile income, they were actually lost ground in the late 70s, early 80s, grew a little bit, lost a bit more in the early 90s grew some throughout the 90s and then came back down, uh, such that over this roughly 40-year you know, period, uh, those in the 20th percentile are barely ahead of where they were in 1973. If we look at the median incomes, they're doing a little bit better, about 20% more than they were earning back in 1973. But those who've grown the most are those in the upper part of the income distribution. Um, so that's where we've seen earning growth, but not among uh, those who are at the median or, or lower. And to put a finer point on it, if you actually look at the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth quintiles, this goes back to 1965, you can see that the bottom two quintiles incomes have been relatively flat over the last 50 years. There's been modest growth in the third and fourth, quint um, fourth quantiles, or, or quintiles. <laughs> this is my RA, I didn't catch that. Um, if we look, you, you see that the biggest growth, though, is in the top quintile, and it's really among those, among our highest earners in the top 5%. If we were to go even higher than that, you see even more growth. So that our income, this is just another way of saying we have increasing income inequality, uh, and that incomes have been rather stagnant for the, for the majority of Americans, which is really going to make it hard. If incomes are stagnant, it's going to make it hard for one generation to beat the next. So the question at hand, uh, for the talk today is what might be the role of higher ed, notice I stuck the higher part in there, uh, what might be the role of higher education at improving it, uh, adult outcomes or at fostering income um, mobility. So um, l telling you things you don't, uh, telling you things you don't really already know. So many of you know this chart. So we really do believe that education is one way by which people do earn higher uh, levels of income. And we believe that as economists because uh, of this one chart, which you can get three economists in the room and they might actually agree that we have this stylized fact if we look at the relationship between education and income. It's one of the few um, stylized facts I would say that economists do agree on, which is that if you look, um, when we look at the pre-high school year, so this is going back to you know, no schooling, in the US, this is using data from the US from the current population survey, there are not that many people who haven't completed especially a middle school education. Um, e even dropout, the rate of dropping out of high school has been dropping in this country. So the bulk of Americans are somewhere here, or I don't want to just say Americans, but those who've been in the US and educated in the US are going to be somewhere in here. And even with our graduation rates rounding out around at least 80%, um, most folks are actually going to be in this part of the district of, of, our, of our chart. And so you can see that starting in about 11th grade, there's a fairly linear relationship between um, earnings and income. And uh, this is something on which uh, we all agree, and it's part of the reason why it feels like with policymakers being the education ex, president, congressperson, whatever, uh, it feels like mother's milk because uh, what, what, who's going to argue that we shouldn't have more education? One thing that I think people don't appreciate as much, although I th you know, labor economists understand it, 
is that um, when we say that there's this return to schooling, it's not just in the income, but it also means you're more likely to get a job, period. Um, during the recession, when I was at the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, the unemployment rate for uh, college educated workers, it was one of the first times that during a recession the unemployment rate actually doubled for college educated workers. It had been around 2% and doubled to about 4% and suddenly people were saying a college education isn't worth it um, because not everybody got a job. Uh, but you know, you wanted to go back to that saying, well, if you think education is expensive or you think it's hard to get a job with some college education, try it without it. Um, because the unemployment rate is, ha has a, rarely, a fairly strong relationship with um, years of schooling, which is that the, unemployment, the overall unemployment rate, it tends to be about half that for those who don't have a high school diploma. During times of recession, both of those double, um, but the relationships tend to be pretty, pretty stable. The ratios tend to be fairly stable. And so you see this fairly strong relationship between your likelihood of being unemployed and the years of schooling completed. So again, we see that those who have higher schooling have better outcomes. Okay, that's fantastic. And if you actually look through the literature, you'll see that economists and others have documented other, other outcomes as well. So other benefits, you know, if we go back to our principles course in micro, we think of there are more private benefits and there are more social benefits. So among the private benefits, um, you know, people have better employment outcomes, which I just showed you. Uh, higher earnings goes into that as well. They have better health. Their children have better health. Their children are more likely to have increased uh, years of schooling. Um, there are decreased chances of divorce to think that you think that that's a positive outcome. Um, they have increased financial market participation, lower chances of bankruptcy. So all these have been associated with um, greater years of schooling. And if we look at the societal benefits, we see a relationship um, an inverse relationship between years of schooling and crime, uh, more likely to vote, more likely to be politically informed, more likely to believe in free speech, a foundation of our democracy, uh, more likely to pay taxes, which is a social benefit, although that's obviously related to the labor market outcomes. Uh, they generate spillovers to other workers. Enrico Moretti has documented that in cities where there are higher um, years of schooling with greater educational attainment, not only do those with the greater <coughs> years of schooling have higher earnings, but so do those who have less education, suggesting that there are spillovers to, um, to their less educated coworkers as well. And they're more likely to engage in environmentally friendly behavior. Again, you might believe that that's, for some of us, that's a positive spillover. Um, all right, it shouldn't be that cynical, especially not on tape. Uh, but anyway, so that's a, po a positive social benefit as well. Um, um, and if you talk to the government uh, forecasters, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they would argue, and what they're forecasting is that the greatest growth in um, employment growth coming going forward is going to be related to uh, jobs that are associated with needing higher levels of schooling. So it all seems that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons to believe that education, since we think that what happens, at least this is what one theory is, that if schooling makes workers more productive, which means that they are going to contribute more, we see the benefits in terms of private benefits and the social benefits. Okay. Of course, I'm going to take a little detour because I wasn't sure about my audience to say, but obviously we're never sure whether this is a causal relationship. And so economists and others have spent a lot of time and energy uh, trying to come up with strategies for teasing out whether this relationship is just relational, that it happens to be that higher, more motivated people, more able people get more years of schooling and earn more, or whether it's actually causal. So ideally, we would do an experiment where we randomly assign people to whether they go to college or not, wait several years, that's one challenge, and then compare the outcomes of those who've completed schooling the, or assigned to attend college or not. The key with the random assignment is that the decision to go to college is not related to the individual's background. And I just want to emphasize that because it's going to come up again. Um, and, but, and so you know, the strategy behind other ways of trying to get, if you don't have a randomized experiment, but the other, the, to tease out the causality, is to look for something that is related to getting more schooling but isn't related to the person's background. So economists have looked at twin studies. So um, I've, I did some of this with my colleagues uh, many years ago. I think the official number is 200 years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, uh, but it feels that way. Uh, and you know, the, the thing about twins is that, especially identical twins, is they have identic genetical material because it was a fertilized that split at some point. Um, obviously, once it splits, they're in different environments, even in, your, in utero. But nonetheless, even with twin studies, one does observe that the twin that gets more years of schooling has higher earnings. 
Um, uh, economists have used natural experiments using compulsory schooling laws in the United States and around the world, um, using distance to the local community college or distance to the local four-year college um, as natural experiments, again, finding rather robust um, benefits to schooling. Um, and then there have been randomized evaluations of some programs which are closely related to higher ed, especially job training programs. And again, finding that those who are assigned to essentially classroom experiences um, earn more. So what, I'm, what we want to take away from this is that we do think some of this is causal. So that, so in answer, the first part of the answer to can education help foster mobility, we have to have some sense that there is a causal relationship between education and mobility, economic outcomes, and I think there is. Um, and furthermore, uh, again, this was work we did with, I did with Orly Ashenfelter uh, on identical twins where we used the AFQT, which is a test which was given to um, individuals in the National Longitudinal Study of Youth. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Um, and divided them up by uh, quartile. So we, were, we started with twins, but we were using the NLS Y for this. Um, and basically uh, find that the return to schooling looks pretty constant over the AFQT distribution. We also did this by looking at family background. We did this for identical twins from different family backgrounds. And returns to schooling look fairly similar. Um, if anything, they look to be higher among those who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds, um, contrary to what some people argue in the press. Um, OK, so we think that there is a causal relationship between schooling and educational outcomes. So that's, that's, you know, that's good. So that's case one. And what we can see over time in the US is that individuals have responded to the increasing returns to schooling that we do observe in the US. Um, I didn't show you that over time, but they have uh, really been increasing. Uh, one of uh, what we were just chatting about before the talk is, um, and you can see the response. That, so then this sets the percentage of the population uh, 25 years and older uh, to have each level of schooling to zero in 1992 and then measuring the change in the proportion of the population with that level of schooling over time. So what it just jumps out very clearly is anything below 100, there's been decreases. So in the US, we have strong decreases in those who have less than high school education, which I alluded to earlier. We see even decreases in those who stop with a high school degree only, which means that in the US, we have increasing proportions of individuals who have at least some college. Um, and you can see that the some college is sort of, you know, a smidgen ahead of 100. So there's a growth of about, what, 2 or 3% in there. Um, but there is definitely growth in the percentage of the population with an associate's degree, um, with a bachelor's degree. And you can see that actually the percentage with a graduate degree has been increasing. And actually, if we look at returns to schooling in the US, the part of the educational distribution where we're seeing the biggest gains um, over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years is of those who have a post-baccalaureate degree. So the rat race continues. So individuals have responded, and, but what are they getting for it? So um, uh, as, as I've done a lot of my work on community colleges, and I'm going to be heading there. But just to set the scene, um, when we think about where individuals are going to, to, to post-secondary institutions, this is just a pie chart of enrollment. Now, enrollment means many things. It's anything post-secondary in a degree-granting institution. Some of that's at the BA level. Some of that is higher. Um, some people are, are enrolled part-time, some are full-time. Just throw everybody in. And uh, what you can see is about two-thirds are in some form of a four-year institution. So about 41% are in a public four-year institution. About 20% uh, are in a not-for-profit institution. And about 6% are in a for-profit four-year institution. Um, the, uh, the, so that's about two-thirds. The remaining third are in a two-year institution. Two-year institutions are really public institutions. So you see that the, you know, over 90% of two-year institutions are public. There is a sliver that are not for profit, pretty much ignore them. There's a growing percentage that are for profit. In fact, if you look at the 8% the that the 1.4 and 6.3 represent uh, in the for profit sector, that's the fastest growing sector in public ed in higher education. Um, I'm going to have one last slide on it. I think we should be concerned about it. Obviously, people in Washington are pretty concerned about it. Um, because it is fast growing, the, econ the economics don't make a lot of sense to me, um, and it's not clear the benefits are there. 
So, um, so you can see that individuals are, you know, about two-thirds are in four-year institutions and about one-third in two-year. And I just want to highlight the importance of two-year institutions um, as, as this is the proportion of first-time first-year students that are enrolled in a public two-year college. And you see it reached a height in the early 80s and has been slowly coming down. This is as the for-profits in particular are picking up and picking up some of the slack. Um, but that, um, you know, almost 40%, about 36, 37% of first-time first-year students are enrolled in a two-year institution. Um, when we think about economic mobility, which is really individuals who are coming from families, I'm going to show you a chart um, again by Chetty, from the lower, say, uh, the lowest quintile of family income, uh, most of them are going to a public two-year institution as their entree to, to the post-secondary. So po post-secondary institutions, they exist in almost every neighborhood um, in the US, uh, or at least they're close, they're close to that. So individuals can live at home while they're going to school. They tend to be more flexible in scheduling so people can work while they're going to school. So they have more non-traditional students in a four-year institution. You, over half of, ins of the students tend to be what we call traditional, meaning they're about 18 to 23. They're still dependent on their parents. They don't have children. They're not working. They attend full time. Uh, only about 10% of two-year college students fall into that category. So when we talk about that margin for increasing access to, to post-secondary education, it tends to be in the two-year sector, which is why I find it fascinating, but also it's why if we're really going to uh, juice the role of higher education and mobility, this is the sector we need to be looking at. So just to put that into context, this is um, data, again, from Raj Chetty. Uh, again, it's descriptive. Uh, this is a higher challenge for mobility. The first slide I showed you just said, did the child earn more than the parents? And I don't know at which point he decided more, so I don't know if you earn a dollar more, whether that counted as more. But this is a much tougher uh, uh, metric, a much higher bar. So this success rate says, what's the probability that a child who is born to a family in the first quintile, for the, so the parents are in the first quintile, what's the likelihood that the child ends up in the fifth quintile? So that's a lot of mobility, right? That, that's, that's a lot of mobility. Um, and this is what he has looked at individuals who went to selective public colleges. So the University of Wisconsin system would be a highly selective college system. This is one tier down. Um, and uh, and uh, so on the y-axis is the mobility rate. This is what we might call the access rate. So it's a fraction of parents in the bottom quintile at that school. So you can see that in the, so like if you did, if I did the chart for elite colleges, the, the data are concentrated here because most of their students, um, actually the data are concentrated out here because most of the students are not, or down here, because most of the students are not from the bottom quintile. Blah, I'll get it out. Um, <laughs> Keep trying. Um, so, uh, but at these selective institutions, so these are four-year institutions. They tend to, they also at the four-year level is where you'd get um, more access. You can see that though most of the data are concentrated with families that are below 20, it, for the institutions, fewer than 20% of the students come from parents in the bottom 20%. Uh, and you can see the, um, but you can see that these selective institutions nonetheless are moving, helping some of the students move all the way up to the fifth quintile. Okay. If we were to look at the University of Wisconsin um, system, uh, the access rate is about uh, 4%. So about 4% um, of the students come from the bottom quintile. And in about, uh, the, the success rate is about 22%. So I personally don't think that's bad given this rather high bar for mobility. But nonetheless, um, uh, you might ask if we can do better. This is the same chart looking at two-year colleges and where they fit on those data. So you can already see that they are educating, you know, in two-year colleges you have a much greater fraction of the students that are coming from the bottom quintile of family income. They're also not getting as far up on the y-axis. Now why is that? And that's what I want to spend the rest of my talk about. So they are making some movement, right? Some of the, the remember, this is the high bar. Some of them are getting into the fifth quintile. Um, even though they were starting in a, or they mostly attend, by his definition, they mostly attended a two-year college. Uh, but nonetheless, why is it that they might not be doing better? 
And I'm going to start by looking at degree attainment into your institution. So I, uh, these data are kind of old because this is a, the, post -sec the beginning post-secondary survey, which goes out six years. And for two-year college students in particular, you need to give them some time because they don't tend to be enrolled full-time. They tend to be in and out of school. Um, and the more recent cohort, we don't have quite as long of a, of a tail to watch them. Um, so if you look at all students that started in 2003, 2004, about 31% of them within six years completed a bachelor's degree, um, and about 9% in associates, 9% a certificate. Notice that about 50% of them have not completed a degree within six years. 15% um, are still enrolled, so keep hope alive. Uh, but 35% of them are no longer enrolled. Now again, for community college students, some of them may not be enrolled at the time of the survey, but will have gone back. And when you look later, community college students have higher educational attainment. But nonetheless, 50% um, haven't completed a degree. When you break it up by public two-year and four-year, you can start to see a pretty big gap, though. So um, among public two-year school students who started in a public two-year college, only 12% have completed a bachelor's compared to 60% who started a four-year college. Um, only 14% have completed an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree. You can see that uh, two-thirds of them have no degree after six years of first enrolling, uh, compared to much lower longers, numbers for those who started a four-year institution. Some might argue, but if you started a community college, maybe you didn't want the bachelor's. Maybe you were just trying to, uh, to take a few classes in order to improve your skills and, and go back to work. Um, but if you look at, for, if we break students into two, students that start in a two-year college, and we look at, first of all, what is their initial degree goal? So almost 60% of those that started in a two-year college still say they would like a bachelor's degree as their highest degree. Now that might be unrealistic, but that's still a pretty high number and it's a pretty big gap between that and only 12% actually completing. Furthermore, if you look among those who would like a bachelor's degree, uh, well, 68% of them complete some college, but only 15% of them complete an associate's degree, and only 17% of them complete a bachelor's degree. So there's still a pretty big gap even among those who say they would like a bachelor's degree and what they're actually able to complete. And that, obviously that compares uh, pretty disfavorably compared to a four-year college, where among those who want a bachelor's degree six years later, 62% of them have actually completed a bachelor's degree. So what is going wrong? So um, I, this is a slide I use a lot and I just kind of like it. I think I like the figure mostly. Uh, but I think my own personal belief is that a large part of the problem is that they've got complicated lives. I mentioned that 10% of them are non-traditional students, which means that they're juggling work, kids, maybe taking care of their parents, maybe have a spouse or a partner, um, all while trying to go to school. Uh, which is, it can be a pretty, you know, they're only 24 hours in the day, so that's a lot to be trying to juggle. Maybe getting the paper in on time isn't your highest priority if you have a child who's homesick. Um, they also, I'm going to come back to academic preparation in just a second. So, um, you know, by many estimates, a very high fraction of high school students are not uh, leaving our high schools prepared for college level um, work. Um, the curriculum is just not really geared to these non-traditional students. Um, and to their lives and also to, the prep to the, their preparation coming in. Uh, lack of institutional support, which I think goes along with the curriculum, but also goes to the advising. If you look at the caseloads of, these, um, of the counselors and advisors in a lot of two-year institutions, they've got caseloads of five, six, seven hundred students uh, per counselor. Uh, and they're just, they, they don't know the students, they don't actually know the schools, they're not checking in with them. And then obviously we have to worry about cost, which I will come back to as well. Um, so first, talking about the preparation, though, and so I want to talk, what I'm working towards is a couple of interventions that try to basically try to address at least two or three of these reasons for non-completion in their reform. So the first problem that uh, both interventions that I'm going to talk about um, try to address is uh, developmental education. So if you look at rates of students that are taking developmental education or remedial classes, uh, this is based on the NAPSES in 2012. 33% um, uh, of them have, by the time they are surveyed, say they have ever taken a developmental education course or a remedial course. So this is in reading, writing, or math. If you look at the fraction that took it in the past year, it's 20%. And that, is, that varies by whether they're in a public two-year institution where you have 40% of the students have ever taken a remedial course. 
25% of them, a quarter of them have taken one in the last year. Uh, much lower levels in four-year institutions at the public sector and much even lower in the not-for-profit sector. Some of this was intentional in the public four-year sector. Um, states like New York shifted remedial education to the two-year colleges. If you needed to take it when you got to college, they required that you started at a two-year college and do it at the two-year college. But none of this, so you can see that part of what two-year colleges are trying to juggle is students that need to be taking some additional coursework to get up to speed. The problem is we don't know how to do it very well. So one, some people would argue that the developmental education, for example, they still insist that people learn how to do, I don't know, in the math, like calculus, uh, trigonometry, a little geometry, whereas really, who really needs that? This room does, but who does in the real world? Uh, it might be more useful for them to know statistics, for example, and that what we're testing them on for the developmental education is not really what they actually need for their jobs. Um, and it's also a problem, this gets in the way in terms of their persistence in, in post-secondary because the developmental education courses typically don't count towards graduation, they're not degree granting. Um, and you can run through your Pell eligibility or some of your financial aid while you're taking these courses and so that you don't have enough financial support for once you, if, you, if you ever emerge from them. So um, one strategy that Washington State has taken is combining dev ed and vocational training together. So they call this the Integrated Basic Education and Skills Training Program. They actually had to be kind of creative in funding this, at least initially, because uh, vocational education, um, so uh, developmental education is funded through the Department of Education, and vocational education and training is funded through the Department of Labor, and they actually, you not really have the twain shall not meet, um, in speaking to the person who developed iBest, he said, we just, we, we, we thought we would act first and ask for forgiveness later. Um, and other states have been experimenting with that as well. And at the time, the assistant secretaries in both agencies and both departments were sympathetic with um, institutions trying to combine them, but this is just one example of where funding streams can actually get in the way of reform. Um, but what they did in, in Washington State with iBest is the, the whole purpose was to make, uh, uh, you know, to help accelerate students' progression through post-secondary and help them accumulate more credits. The idea in co-teaching the basic skills with occupational skills was not only to help them, uh, you know, accumulate the, the, the college credits, the occupational credits uh, more quickly, but to also make them more, the developmental education more relevant. So imagine you're a 25-year-old student and you're learning, you know, you're working on your basic reading skills and, you know, watch Dick run is not so interesting, but if it's put in the context of learning about health or, um, you know, advanced manufacturing, whatever the skills you might be acquiring, it's just much more relevant, much more interesting and more motivated. It, these, um, so the programs were uh, medical assistant, nurses aide, these were designed to be occupations that in Washington state they knew or they suspected, they hoped, they guessed, uh, would be in demand when the students came out. Um, and what it did require is that they had two instructors that had to work together. So it did cost a bit more and largely was, that, was have the cost of having two instructors in the class together and the fact that it cost coordination time for them to work together and you have two teachers there at the same time. So what are some, so this was not a randomized evaluation. It was done by the folks at the Community College Center at, at Teachers College. Uh, but what they did was they compared, the, when they rolled out iBEST, they didn't roll it all of, out all over the state at, to start with. So they had students in iBEST and students at other colleges that were not in iBEST. Um, but you can see that those who are enrolled in iBEST were much more likely to have received college credit. Um, you can see that they, um, any college credit, most of those college credits were in a career technical education course because that was the design of the program, but that, so that's not a big surprise. Uh, but you can see compared to the comparison group, they were uh, much more likely to do so. Um, if you look at the number of credits earned, they earned about twice as many college credits, again, mostly centered on the CTE credits, but they did seem to accumulate more credits. The story's a little bit mixed, puzzled. There was, this is not a statistically significant difference, but the persistence to this, the following year was not as great among the IBEST students. Again, it's not statistically significant, but it's something to be looking under the hood about as we think about, actually Washington State has already rolled this out all over the state, but the question is why was this? Maybe the students felt they had gotten enough credits and they wanted to move on. 
and were, had the skills to, uh, get, to get a job, although I'm about to show you not, maybe not so much. Um, when we looked, and when they looked at uh, the log hourly wages for the, this is the, this is the IBEST group, that's the program group, if you could tell. Um, you can see that both, uh, if you look at pre-post, uh, they both had lost, so that's not a statistical significance. Um, and this is hours worked, this is not statistically significant. They were looking, they were measuring the outcomes during the downturn. So that may explain this, it still doesn't explain, I mean this is, the IBEST is less negative than the comparison group. Um, but nonetheless, it, it suggests IBEST looks intriguing, they already have rolled out in Washington State. I still think it's worth replicating elsewhere because I think it makes a lot of sense. And actually, there have other there are other models um, like sectoral based training, where again students are basically getting basic skills training, uh, but um, uh, at, while they get some occupational skills. And the reason they call it sectoral training is because they're usually linked up with, say, a union organization or a sector of employers so that the skills that they're learning are the skills that the employers know that they want them to receive. So making de developmental education courses more occupationally relevant for many students, especially first-generation college students, looks like a very promising way to be juicing some mobility. And a second example is from um, a demonstration that, M well, the program has been run by um, CUNY, but MDRC conducted a randomized evaluation, and then I'll talk about um, some new results from their attempt to scale. So CUNY system has been running uh, since, for the last 10 years, the Accelerated Study and Associate Programs, or ASAP. Again, the purpose here is to get students through community college more quickly. Uh, the focus here was to, uh, again, they wanted to tackle this dev ed problem, so their strategy wasn't so much to innovate on the curriculum of DevEd, but it was to say, we're going to give you a lot of counseling to say you need to get those out of the way quickly so that you can keep moving along. So there was a lot of um, focus on getting them to take their DevEd courses early. They had uh, much enhanced advising, so the advisors could actually, they would know the students and could advise them to do so. They also required the students to attend full time. Now many community college students do not. Uh, which may mean that this can't, is never going to be a really scalable reform for all community colleges. But there are students that with some nudges um, will be willing and understanding what the trade-offs might be and really trying to juggle a classwork, as, you know, as a post-secondary schedule while working, could be encouraged to go ahead and try to condense it and bite the bullet and attend full time. Um, and they strongly encourage the students to graduate with, th within three years. So they had enhanced advising, they had special tutoring services as well to help them get through. Uh, they were enrolled, they encouraged them and made it a little easier for them to take linked courses for community college students that can be important because they're usually not residential and so they don't get to know their classmates at all. And so by having courses that are linked that you take with a group of students, you get to know a cohort um, and it can make for a better social environment. The, the evidence on, learn, on what we call learning communities is actually pretty mixed, but nonetheless I can see as part of an overall reform could, um, could make a difference. Um, and the students got a tuition waiver, so they worked pretty hard to reduce the cost of going to CUNY for them. <laughs> okay, the students also got, um, so they got a tuition waiver that covered the gap between tuition and fees and financial aid. And uh, something that MDRC thinks was possibly important in New York City was this Metro card, which they got this Metro card, it made it easier for them to get around and actually get to class. Uh, um, so in their own eva in randomized evaluation, they were focused on um, Pell eligible students, um, especially uh, and students or students whose family income was uh, less than 200% of the federal poverty line. They wanted to focus on students that needed to take one or two deaf ed courses. Um, they wanted to they focused on students who had previously earned few college credits because they were thinking about students just starting. NYC residents were willing to attend full time because it was part of ASAP and were in an ASAP eligible major. They started in 2010 and there were just under 1,000 students who participated. Um, so what did they find in their randomized evaluation? So this is looking after three years. You can see that those in ASAP had earned, 41% uh, had earned any college degree after three years compared to only 22% of the control group. 25% um, of them were enrolled in a four year college compared to only 17% of the control group. So these were fairly impressive educational gains um, for this program, which largely you know, really encouraged the students to focus on their schooling while they were in school, 
um, did provide some of the tuition assistance um, and also uh, provided enhanced counseling. Um, if you looked at the total credits earned, this is a statistically significant difference. Um, those uh, in the ASAP group had earned more credits than those in the control group as well. Um, so these were really impressive results uh, you know, that we ha don't typically see in evaluations of programs at the post-secondary level. So MDRC is currently scaling. They're trying, they have, they have replicated ASAP in three community colleges in Ohio. In all three sites, the students are more non-traditional than in New York, which means that they are that more of them are working, they are older, they're more likely to have children. Uh, so they only have very interim results. Two semesters, they were pushing it. It's more like a semester and a half since we're on assignment. But their early impacts were promising. So they see that there are enrollment impacts after the first and second semesters, differences between the programming and control groups. They see that the program group attempted more credits in the first and second semesters in the comparison than the control group. They have two cohorts now. I think they're working up to three. Um, in the first cohort, they also see that the credit earns in the first semester were greater than the credits earned uh, for the control group in the first semester, too early to help for the second semester. The size of the, the magnitude of the impacts is smaller than in New York. They're not statistically different than New York, but it may be that they're going to be smaller than New York, but they are, they are seeing some impact. Would be pretty exciting if this actually applied in a very, very different setting than New York City. And a different labor market, too. Com completely different labor market, exactly. Um, so the last point that I want to make in reform that I want to talk about is around um, financial aid. So this, this is a chart that shows um, tuition. Uh, we've got the top, the, the top line being private, four-year, not-for-profit not tuition, the sticker price. That's what everybody looks at every year. It's gone up like gangbusters. Uh, the College Board likes to remind us every year that the sticker price isn't what most students pay. Uh, and so the dashed line is actually tuition net of financial aid, which they, they guesstimate. They put in an estimate. But nonetheless, you can see that the growth has been much slower because of increases in Pell Grants and tuition tax credits. Um, and um, state financial aid as well. But, um, so you can see that's been much slower. You can see the public institutions, again, the sticker prices come up. Uh, if you look at the net, it has been much slower. Uh, nonetheless, you know, these are real pressures, but the net tuition uh, increases have been much slower than most people advertise. And if you look at public to your, to your tuitions, uh, if you take into consideration Pell Grants and other financial aid, uh, there's, um, it's actually, basically been no change, and it's basically zero, basically free, um, uh, for at least on average. Nonetheless, uh, if this is a chart of total Pell Grant expenditures, on the left-hand side, we currently spend about $28 billion on Pell Grants every year, um, and, and that's serving about 7.8 million students. Did I get my numbers right? No. Uh, yes. Um, at 7.8 million students. So Pell Grants are one of the major ways by which we try to improve access in post-secondary education. And we hope, and we don't have as much evidence on this, but persistence as well, uh, a, a major investment at the federal level for um, offsetting the cost. Um, during the Obama administration, there was a really big push as part of the Recovery Act and beyond um, to uh, shore up the Pell Grant program. So they, so they pushed through an increase in the maximum Pell, which increased the average Pell Grant per recipient. Uh, that was then. The new budget looks a little less generous when it comes to Pell, but that will TBD uh, as it rolls through Congress. Um, given the size of the investment, many people have pondered, even in the Obama administration, which was very supportive of Pell, are there, are there reforms to Pell that could make, make it even more effective? Um, what I want to talk about are some experiments that I've been involved with MD, MDRC and that MDRC has done around performance-based scholarships. I want to highlight from the outset that this does not necessarily mean that making Pell more performance-based, which means that you don't get paid up front, but you get paid if you're staying in school and getting good grades, would have the same uh, impact uh, because Pell is a much more generous grant uh, it's the first dollar grant. The, the, the studies that I'm going to show you were last dollar, so they were on top of Pell. 
So it doesn't mean that you would get the same behavioral responses if you were to make Pell performance-based. So I have to put that little asterisk up there uh, because I think it's real. But nonetheless, I think it's still motivated from the, you know, we think grant aid is important and it's important to uh, support students when they go to college. Uh, but are there reforms we can make that would make it even more effective? So uh, this is, so the, the reform that we were looking at, uh, financial aid, was what we call performance-based scholarship. And the idea was you're not just given a lump um, sum of money up front that you could use to pay for tuition or books or whatever you need to do, um, but that you're getting the money, you might get some of it up front, but that the rest of it you're going to get as you go. One, you could think about this as almost like treating schooling as a job, right? You get paid weekly or bi-weekly or monthly after you've done the work. Um, and you, so essentially we're sort of paying the students. And as an economist, the way I think about it is pulling forward the return to schooling or pulling it forward. So instead of having to wait until you've completed all of your schooling in order to get an economic return, we're saying if you do some of the internal steps that we think are important for success in schooling, we're going to, pay, we're going to have that payoff come much more quickly. Um, so uh, this is one. This was an early example. I worked on this project with MDRC. Uh, it was what was called opening doors. Uh, it was at two community colleges in Louisiana. Um, and so what the students would get is $250 upon enrolling at least half time. Uh, get another $250 if they had at least a C average at midterms. Uh, get another $500 if they had passed all their classes and earned at least a 2.0 GPA. And they could repeat this for a second semester, so you get a total of $2,000. So um, the, I know the benchmark, you know, what's the hurdle that they have to get over in order to get the performance, the performance scholarship looks low. At this, these community colleges, uh, that was actually fairly uh, tough for many of the students. Um, so the first question is, uh, did it change behavior? Now I'm going to actually be pivoting from studies. Uh, but this came from two other different sites. I was working with Lisa Barrow, where we actually did time use studies uh, and done in New York City and in California, uh, where we said, if you're looking at the treatment group and control group, how did you, what did you do last week and had them fill out time diaries um, over the last 24 hours and also ask them questions over the past week. And what we found is that students who were given uh, the incentive did shift some of their time to academic activities. I thought this was an important thing to establish because often when we do these experiments, we say we give you money, this is the theory why we think why it should work, but we actually don't try to get inside the black box. So this suggests that students get it, right? So if you give them the incentive, they're going to change their behavior. These are scaled impacts, they're not big. They're statistically significant, but not huge. But you can see that on the margin, they were more likely to spend time on academic activities. Um, using some psychological measures of their, their quality of their educational input, feel like they got it, and they spent, they took, spent a little less time on non-academic activities. We did not detect as much of an impact on work, specifically though, which is one margin that we would have expected them to adjust on. Okay, so but do they improve educational attainment? So if we go back to the opening door study that I told you about, which was really the original study that we did with MDRC, so in the uh, the dark blue is the program group, and this is a control group. The program group was slightly more likely to, en to enroll in any course the first semester. That's the one star suggests that it's only significant at the 10% level. Not a huge surprise, the students were already on campus by the time they were randomly assigned. Um, so even the control group was fairly motivated to, be, uh, to at least enroll. If we look at the second semester, though, we start to see that there was a pretty big statistically significant difference. And the students in the program group were more likely to enroll in the second semester. Um, if we look at total credits attempted, again, not a big difference in the treatment group and control group in the first semester. But if we look at the credits earned, there was actually a pretty big difference between treatment and control. If we go to the second semester, we see that the program group attempted more credits and earned more credits as well. Um, and if we look at uh, sort of longer term, we see the total credit difference in the first year is about 3.3 credits. This is a low bar. The, the, the success rate in these community colleges was quite low to begin with. Um, not as much of a difference in the second semester, but if we look at total credits are earned over the first two years, largely from the, birth, the boost in the first year, we see about 3.7 difference in credits, uh, which was uh, actually fairly large for these two communities. MDRC then, everybody was so excited about opening doors, they did replicate it in many other sites. Um, so they, these are all, have slightly different versions of um, 
uh, of performance-based scholarships. Um, in New Mexico and possibly Arizona, they were actually in a four-year college. Um, in Arizona, it was Latino men. Uh, but nonetheless, these were all versions of uh, performance-based scholarships. And what she found is Opening Doors probably came out with the heftiest impact on educational attainment. All of them have a positive difference, but you can see that only in a couple of places where there are actually statistical differences between treatments and control. So what I take away from this um, is that, that with these performance-based scholarships, you can provide some incentive that will translate into some difference in educational attainment. It might make a difference as part of an overall package, not a panacea. So my last slide, which is a good thing, um, is I just have to make a, a comment about for-profit institutions. They are the newcomers to the space, and especially for the population of students that I'm really concerned about and that we're worried about for upper mobility, these for-profit institutions are rather attractive. And you can see that they have grown because they can be very nimble. They're much, they move much more quickly at responding to what they believe to be the growing occupations in a particular area. Um, you can see that they grow up and pop up in areas where the two-year colleges in particular are not able to serve all students that are interested in enrolling in college. Um, and they've been very quick at adopting technology. In fact, some innovative uh, like um, text messages sent to students who didn't see you in class, um, have you turned in your assignment, reminders, and ways of staying in touch with them. This is a very heterogeneous sector. Um, and there are some good actors, there are some very bad actors. If you read the New York Times this morning, there are some very bad actors, especially when you combine it with the student loan fiasco. Um, but what's even more troubling is that David Deming and Claire, um, Larry Katz, I think Claudia Golden might have been part of that effort as well, have been studying the economic benefits to for-profit institutions, and they just don't like, look like they're very robust at all. Um, and especially when you combine that with the high cost that comes with many of them, uh, it just doesn't look like it's the best sector in which for students to be investing. Obviously, there are some good ones, but students are going to have to be very cautious when trying to understand, largely because the cost is so high. So in sum, what do I think? I think education is part of the puzzle. It's, it is an important vehicle for fostering um, upward mobility. I don't think it stands alone on, on its own. I don't think any of the results I showed you here would suggest that education alone is going to help students who are start off in the bottom quintile move into the fifth quintile um, or have their, you know, for parents who are the uh, bottom quintile, their kids are going to be in the top quintile. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it's an important avenue. I think the reason why we don't see more mobility um, is because I think there are some challenges in our, in our post-secondary sector. I think two-year colleges, again, are very heterogeneous. Some are fantastic, some are not quite as fantastic. Um, they're dealing with a heterogeneous population, which makes it a challenge. But I think we need to see some innovative thinking in terms of de developmental education in particular, um, combining occupational training with developmental education, making sure that the classes are really relevant to the local labor markets, um, and finding ways to help students really manage their time so that they are either enrolled more time in school, or um, actually I'm a really big fan of trying to get more students to focus on their schooling while they're in school so they get more through more quickly and then can um, become productive workers. Um, the reforms that the, and the reforms that focus on those issues I think have been more promising. The reform, at least performance-based scholarships in the financial aid space, I think is part of a package, may be something to consider, but I don't think it's a panacea in and of, in of itself. Um, and so overall, I think we're making progress, but there's much to be done and much to be learned. So thank you.